Hi, everybody. Uh, just want to introduce you to uh, our next luncheon series here today. Um, and this is uh, the topic is the, the Cerberus training data set. It's uh, done in conjunction here with uh, the, the uh, Secretary of Defense Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, OSD CAPE, uh, and, and Tech Elodi. And our speakers here today are Daniel Germany and, and Adam James from, from Technologies. Um, wanted to, uh, to introduce the two here and we'll get started uh, with, uh, with Dan Germany. Thanks so much, George. Uh, and good morning, everybody. I'm glad to have you with us here today. Um, hoping that you can all get something out of today's session and, um, and enjoy it as well. Um, like George said, my name is Dan Germoni. I'm joined uh, uh, by Adam James, and we're here to talk about the Cerberus training data set. Um, I suspect there'll be other meetings on this data set. I, for one, am going to go on a bit of a road show, um, but I did, it was important to me that the uh, I see a Washington area chapter got the first cut at this data set. So you all currently have the exclusive and can get after using this data set um, sooner than everybody else. Um, Adam, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, you know, my hope today is to bring awareness of the training data set. Uh, it's really built for the cost community. And I'll talk about, you know, sort of why we built it and um, why I think you all should use it or some benefits um, that we as a community can gain if everybody starts using it. Um, also want to make sure uh, that, so, you know, again, people are encouraged to use this data set, but wanted to both raise awareness of the data set for its own purposes, but also give you a sense of sort of how we created it. Um, it might not be quote unquote core cost estimating type work, um, but certainly Adam's going to take you through and show you how he created the data set or how he and the team created it. And I think there's some real interesting uh, elements of that as well. So not only getting to know the data set and, and learning how to, where to get it, how to download it, um, but also learning how it was developed, I think is a really interesting technical uh, challenge and one that uh, Adam and the team have really done a great job um, tackling. Uh, next slide, please. So why create this data set? You know, we've, we've had training data out there before. We've had some example data out there before for um, cost estimate and analysis. Um, why wasn't that sufficient? Why spend good government resources developing this? Um, you know, the reality is that I think we've all run into the problem where the data that we use on our daily basis uh, to do our daily jobs is often proprietary or sensitive in nature. And at events like this with ICEA, when we're trying to share tools and techniques and interesting things that we've learned, you know, we often can't share the real life data that we've used because it is sensitive or proprietary. And that really does make it more difficult to show off cool things you've done or models you've built or even just demo systems you've, you've, you've developed. Um, you know, historically the data sets that we do have that are non-proprietary have been relatively small and not very complex. Um, and sometimes that's a feature, not a bug. If you're just trying to teach somebody something very simple, if you just want to show a simple regression, you know, for one program, a couple independent variables, you don't necessarily want to have a hundred thousand or a million rows of data, but you really quickly can outgrow um, those small data sets when trying to build cool, interesting things or show more advanced techniques. Um, and I really have struggled in my uh, you know, career to find any data set that really shows um, multiple submissions of the same type of data over time so that we can look and look at time series type analyses or what did last year's submission look like compared to this year's submission. Um, and then, you know, especially in the CSDR universe, the, you know, the type of cost uh, data that OSD prescribes and that we collect on our, our major defense acquisition programs, th there's about like a dozen or so different possible uh, deliverables and some of those deliverables really are linked and you should be able to see that trace from one to the other, but we really haven't ever had a great pile of data or examples that we can use to show contractors or our analysts how one report should look when compared to another or over time. No, those are all things that have really hindered both training from the government analyst perspective and also the contractor perspective. It's made it more difficult for them to prepare deliverables since they haven't ne necessarily had a real world level uh, example to look at. Um, you know, also looking at the sort of the data science practitioners out there, 
What we often see or what I've seen is that if you're you know, an R user or a Python user, there are these couple of data sets that have been rolling around for you know, decades and people use them ubiquitously to show off new tools. You know, it's, it's a way of saying, you know, everybody kind of gets to know and knows what the Iris data set looks like or what the MT cars data sets look like. So if you're demoing a tool or you're trying to plot something, it, it's controlling for one more variable when you're trying to do something new or difficult. You're not having to both get to know a data set and get to know a new tool or technique. We can just focus on getting to know that new thing and the sample data set can remain constant over time. So my real goal with the, the, the Cerberus data set was to you know, create an equivalent to the IRIS or the MT CARS data set that we cost estimators can use when building tools or demoing techniques or just training our people to use real world level complexity data um, to perform cost estimating and analysis type tasks. Uh, next slide, please. So we had to make up a fictional program to sort of build this data around. And the fictional program we came up with is called the Cerberus Autonomous Vehicle Program. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that fictional program just so you can get a sense of what that data kind of looks like. But I think what you'll find is when we do have a fake program, quote unquote, to work from and some context, it really makes it easier to build interesting and compelling narratives um, to, into the data that we can then use as teaching moments or as techniques when, when building the data set and when doing analysis. So the Cerberus training program is a, a notional army ground vehicle program. It's an ACAT one level type program. So it's a big program. Um, the time frame that we're sort of creating fake data around or that's included in the data set is both development and initial low rate uh, initial production. And that's really nice because it gives us an opportunity to show like what non-recurring costs are time phased like versus production type costs in that LREP type environment. We also have learning curves, you know, traditionally between those two phases or step down factors. So that's really the sweet spot when it comes to showing lots of interesting things um, in a program's life cycle, in my opinion. Um, we've modeled a, a single award, a FAR 15 contract that's an IDIQ. So we've got different uh, delivery orders that are delivering different quantities of things over time. Again, gives us the opportunity to introduce some variability um, that folks can then tease out of the data and take a look at. Uh, we've got firm fixed price cleanse and cost plus cleanse. Those things get, you should analyze those differently. They appear differently in data. We wanted to make sure we had a little bit of both. Um, and we've got some contractor logistics support in here as well, along with some total package fielding so that we can look at some sustainment type data in addition to that initial production type data. Um, you know, what I think you'll see if you pull down the data and you take a look at it, we do have initial submissions like that occur at the beginning of a contract and sort of baseline a contract, but then you can follow that program over multiple years of submissions and you can do some analysis to say how close or far was this program compared to what someone thought it might be? And what you'll find, as you often do in reality, is that there's cost growth. And you know, in our case, we, we sort of were specific about where we did and didn't put cost growth. We sort of tried to put some specifically in software cost development. But if you dive into that analysis, you'll find some interesting other nuggets as well. Um, you know, as we, as we think about the program, the sort of uh, you know, we didn't just make this up out of real or out of nothing. The sort of inspiration programs that we wanted to feature on are on the right there. Overall, the Cerberus program looks a lot like um, the RCV Medium program. Uh, frankly, we stole from that um, pretty, pretty significantly. But it has kits that are uh, ubiquitous for the JLTV program and that we're seeing on a lot more vehicles. Kits really provide an opportunity to mix in um, some complexity in the data and have multiple end items. So that's really interesting. We also have multiple variants, which are featured in the JLTB program as well. Um, and then we have multiple different armaments. That's important because armaments often drive costs, but it gives us a good excuse to introduce government furnished equipment. Some of the Cerberus program is government furnished equipment to the prime contractor. And that again, how you manage that as a cost estimator, how you find that in the data and how you account for that in the data is really important. So again, getting and mixing in uh, GFE was really important to us as well. Next slide, please. So why Cerberus? That's a weird word. It's one that a lot of people don't know. Um, you know, Cerberus is just, it's a, it comes from Greek mythology. It's Hades' dog who guards, um, guards the underworld. 
Uh, there's a little photo there from like 1550 or something, uh, Hercules grabbing uh, Cerberus's collar. Um, so the three-headed dog and the Cerberus program come from this idea that the Cerberus vehicle has three major armaments, three things that can bite you. There's a 30 millimeter turret, that's what's provided as GFE. There's a 50 cal remote weapon station, that's like the gun on a little swivel, um, a smaller gun on a little, little swivel, and then an anti-tank fire and forget javelin type system uh, that's mounted to that as well. So this, you know, army people, the, you know, COCOM commanders would really like this vehicle. It's small, it can shoot lots of things from a long distance, and it's autonomous. Um, because it's autonomous, it gives us an opportunity to introduce software data reporting. Um, we call SRDR in the CSDR world. And so you can see here, we've got four different major CSCIs that are gonna be developed and reported in this program. Um, and one or two of those are gonna be what ultimately causes the program some issues. To the right, you can see the overall prime mission product WBS. Again, there's some lot, lot of great training opportunities here. This is based on MIL standard 881, but there are a couple areas in which we have some tailored WBS elements and having those tailored elements helps ensure that we can produce training that shows people how to identify and account for those tailored elements. Um, and so that again is just a real, real rich place to, to develop training and, and look to see how you should manage a more complex program than 881 might allow for automatically. Next slide. All right, so what do you actually get in the Cerberus data? We've heard enough about it. What does it actually look like? This is an eye chart. There is no getting around that. And that is frankly on purpose because I wanted to make sure folks were aware of the richness of this universe that we've created. So there's two sets of blue boxes on this screen with lots of little boxes inside. Um, the, the bigger blue box to the left is really what you get in the core Cerberus training data set. So it starts with the CSDR plan itself cost and software data reporting plan. That's the document that goes into the contract and that's what establishes the overall cost reporting requirement for a given contract. Um, we've got both Excel and XML versions of that CSDR plan uh, in this data set um, for folks to look at and be able to see and how do I bake up a CSDR plan? What does that CSDR plan look like? And then what's really good is you can see this was what the plan looks like. Now let's see the data that came out of that plan. Moving down, we have the cost and hour report or the flex file. That's really the core of the CSDR universe, along with the quantity data report, which um, to the right of it, uh, you know, these two deliverables, there's a couple sets of, there's a couple set of them. There's a contract award, there's a contract complete, and then we've got some interim submissions as well. And again, another great teaching moment. One of those submissions actually has mistakes in it. You know, it's a normal day in the life process in cost estimation to get a report from a contractor and have to review it and say, does this look right or wrong? Frequently they're wrong, and it's good to be able to train analysts to figure out where they're wrong and how to spot those, those problems so you don't accept that data incorrectly and then negatively impact your model down the line. And that's something we have featured in the Cerberus training data set. Um, continuing, we've got a couple different SRDR development reports. Those are really critical for the software folks and that, uh, that data really uh, provides additional details into software uh, development, including both the costs and hours, but also things like this uh, source lines of code, new, modified, and changed. Really interesting reports, heavy lifts to intellectually get your head around at first. Now we've got some real world level uh, submissions that folks can do that with. Uh, the tech data report reports planned and actual levels of performance for the system. I talked earlier that this is an EMD to LREP contract. What you should expect to see in EMD are proposed levels of performance that are estimated. No one's built that thing. We don't know what it's gonna look like. Well, what happens five, six years later when we have built a bunch of these and fielded them? We should expect to see differences between planned performance and actual tested performance. And in some cases, we should be able to trace those performance changes to cost deltas in the WBS. We thought we needed a small engine. We actually needed a big engine. The engine costs more money. Again, really good stuff that we should be able to look at and train our people to find and, and leverage. Um, next, we've got the maintenance and repair parts report. Uh, that's a report that asks the contractor to tell the government about every single time it touches a vehicle to perform maintenance, the parts, and then identify the parts that were removed and replaced, repaired and washed out. They also write down stuff like, like miles driven on the odometer. So that's a great place for folks to learn how to do some ONS type estimating 
what how what's the mean time between move, removal for this part what's the average op tempo for this system how frequently does this part number break versus this other part number great way to get after that type of analysis is in that MNR report um, next we've got the contractor business data report that's a report that talks about an entirety of a contract's division all of their rates, all their bases and pools applicable to the instant, to an instant contract, but also every other contract they have available. You know, the rates information from a contractor's base and pools should immediately feed the flex file. There should be a one for one link. There really should not, there's not a lot of good reasons for those to not match. And so the Cerberus data set lets you pull up a dash three, the contractor business data report, pull up a flex file and see if those rates really do match. Uh, we also have some SAR data, that's the Selected Acquisition Report. That's not, a, again, not applicable to an individual contract, but it is applicable to an entire program. If you're a major, pro if you're a program and you're a program office, most of your money is going to be spent on a contract, but you also spend money on other things. And the SAR helps tell Congress and the public what those things look like. And we do have some SAR data. Um, the, the data, frankly, is done. We're just modifying the system to allow it to be updated. But once it's up there, you'll be able to see how much of this program was funded on this contract versus other places. Um, we also have some deliverables called the resource distribution table. Um, they're frankly going through some evolution right now. As soon as those data item descriptions and contractor provided uh, or program office required formats are done, we'll update the Cerberus data set. These will be new uh, deliverables that no one has produced so far other than some pilots contractors and program offices are gonna be required to build these. And so these examples are gonna be really helpful. Um, moving along, uh, you know, we don't just automatically get this cost and software data. We have to put scope of work and seed drills onto contracts. It's really nice in my opinion to have examples of those scope of work and seed drill languages so that people can see how I should, how my contract should look to ensure the data, I get the data that I want. And that is also featured here in this Cerberus data set. Uh, we have some supporting files as well. They're not sort of core Cerberus if, because they're, you know, um, they serve different purposes, but they're worth mentioning. Uh, the first is the Cerberus package itself. Adam's going to give you some great examples of that here in a few minutes. And it's the code that's used to create Cerberus. You could conceivably create your own data set. And if you wanted to do that, the Cerberus package is what you would use to do that. And so Adam's going to give you a bit of knowledge there. Uh, we've also got some narrative bullet points. We baked these up during the development of the training set. They're nice now to, to see and read because you can go look for them in the data and see where they're at. And they provide an opportunity to, again, help augment some training. Uh, last but not least, we have the CPET tool. Uh, that's a tool that OSD has, has you know, built and developed and is available. Um, it's, a, it's a helper file or it's a helper tool that can help you convert CSDR file formats from one to another. Um, as you'll notice, if you looked closely on the left, we don't produce or we're not giving anybody Excel-based versions of Cerberus um, for the cost and hour report and the quantity data report. Those live natively in JSON, in, in zip files, and if you want to convert them at this point, you've got to go get the CPET tool and learn how to convert it. It's, it's, a, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, next slide, please. So let's look at some examples of what Cerberus looks like, just briefly. Again, we've got probably over a million rows of actual data here that we're talking about. We're not gonna look at all of it today, but I did wanna give some folks an idea of what they can find. And so here we can see total contract costs, final submission, time phased, all of it all in, just split recurring, non-recurring. I talked earlier that this is an EMD and LREP contract. Can you see where EMD starts and ends and where LREP starts and begins? My guess is that you can, you know, example data is often flat, flat, flat. This example data looks more like real life. Next slide, please. Uh, that time phasing we just saw was at the total contract value. And we can see that type of phasing for the PMP, the prime mission product, but we can also see it for common elements. These are uh, MIL standard 881 common elements, they're called, and they exist in virtually every CSDR plan. And, you know, we as analysts want to train our folks what type of phasing they should be looking for. And that phasing is not the same for each of these common elements. So we've gone out of our way to tailor and produce um, time phased costs that look the way they should in real life. Next slide, please. Uh, here we can see some example of labor rates, cost and software data reporting, be it in the flex file or in the 1921-3, uh, has different costs for different labor rates and for different overhead categories. 
You can see some of that here. We've got engineer one, two, and three, and the more senior person has a higher average uh, wrap rate than the more junior people over time. You could imagine getting a CSDR and getting these plots, and if you see a big jump in one month or you see a big dip in another month, that suggests something might be wrong in that source data and you might wanna go back and look into it. Training people to go find those things and find those variances is sort of difficult if you don't have real world level data. And so here you can see we've got that now. Next slide. Uh, and here we have the, some, some example data for those prime mission products. You know, that uh, center most chart is the average unit cost of the different variants of the Cerberus vehicle over time. And we can see that there is an apparent decrease in average unit cost over time. To the right, we have some of its major kits. So we can see those kits seem to be getting less expensive as well. And below we have a learning curve analysis, you know, Y equals MX to the B, everybody's favorite. Um, and you can see there's clear indication in this fake data, both of learning and of a step down rate between EMD and production. Um, in this example, we have it faceted where each of the end items is on its own row. Again, maybe the Y equals MX to the B is gonna look better if we combine them all together because there's a high degree of commonality. It's up to you to go build those regressions in this data and see which model better reflects uh, the way the data works, just like we would be doing with real live estimates. Next slide, please. So that's sort of what the data set looks like. I'm gonna tell you where to get it in a few minutes, but I want you to stay to the end. And so now what I wanna do is make sure you get a sense of just how we built this thing, how Adam and team built this thing. And so for that, I wanna uh, introduce Adam James and have him talk to you a little bit about how all this kind of came to be. Adam, over to you. All right, thanks, thanks Dan, for the uh, heavy overview of this. I'm recognizing a lot of names here. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, Adam James have been around for a while presenting uh, random things all over the place, usually having to do with data and data analysis, and here's no different, right? So uh, Dan, Dan backed up to the high level of what this data looks like. And now, because uh, this is what we like to do, let's dive in a little to the methodology uh, to, to some degree on what we did. So as an overview on how the core data, the core flex file data, is generated, we start with Excel templates. And this isn't just like a flat sheet. This is 25 tables where you specify everything from uh, functional categories to labor rate to your, uh, your wage growth, your escalation, uh, end items, what lots you're using, all of these things in this Excel sheet uh, I'll pull up later. And these tables get pulled and ported into R. That's important because you can actually replace this file and everything, everything will change. Everything, including the name Cerberus, is stored in these Excel sheets. Nothing is hard coded into R. So you could create a ship or a missile system without touching a single line of R code simply by swapping a new config file. So these, these files um, start, load into R, once they're in R, they randomize. Almost every input is stochastic. Labor rates don't say uh, $100, they say $100 and you specify distribution. Any distribution that R recognizes works, normal, uniform, gamma, something ridiculous that you invented on your own, as long as it can access the function, it'll work. So randomized inputs, that helps from a training perspective because you can have a class of 20 people and give them all their own uh, seed. They're all own a uh, randomly generated report. So if they try to cheat off each other, they get different answers and you can catch them. Um, I mean, because it'll be a richer learning experience. And then uh, after that runs, it generates this flat structure. And this flat structure just goes down a tree and starts adding features. It starts with this constant price uh, forecast at complete value. It unitizes it, it breaks it into units, it applies a learning and a rate and a noise analysis to it. It adds on non-recurring costs. It time phases it according to phasing profiles. It applies escalation, which at this point in time is simply wage growth. Uh, it'll break it out into cleansing accounts and it'll also factor out allocations uh, for when that method is used as well. So there's a whole lot going on there. 
Once that's complete, it breaks these down into submission events. It can actually inject submission event errors into them, anomalies. So you can change the order of magnitude. You can flip something into dollars K instead of dollars. You can start changing metadata. You can break some of the additive math. All sorts of things that you'd be able to find later as you review it. And then finally, it, uh, it breaks all of this back out into the actual flex file and quantity data report data object model. So for those of you who know, it's those uh, JSON tables in the zip folder. It'll break it out in that and then write directly back into it. So at the end of the day, you end up with a, uh, with a set of flex files and quantity reports that'll read and load through the CAGE systems, including CPET. So you really just go from Excel template to, uh, to flex files and as fast as your computer will run. So to break this down a bit, just to give you a, a kind of a flavor of what we're looking at, we do a lot of data splitting, but there's a few ways to do it I'll talk about next. But one way to think about it, start with an end item. Uh, it's easy to come and go, and any commodity expert can give you some ROM within a, a meaningful range of what it'll cost. Okay, a ground vehicle person will tell you something like this might cost two million, three million, four million. Who knows for a vehicle in steady, in steady state, so let's simulate a target value to begin with, add noise to it, and then uh, start splitting it down to work breakdown structure. So we allocate down a work breakdown structure, we split out labor and material, we split labor into direct and overhead, we split direct into engineering labor, manufacturing touch labor, and so on, all the functional categories we know and love to direct other labor. And then we can take these broad categories and start splitting these down to actually actual specific labor rates like a senior, mid, and junior engineer. Uh, as Dan said, that'll map back to the uh, business base report, the CBDR. The software lines will map back to SRDRs. Everything just completely breaks down. Same with non-recurring, same with support costs. At the end of the day, you get your hardware plus your development plus your, sort, your support. You get total costs. You add on G&A, um, fee, all the, that good stuff, again, randomly generated. You can hard code in a fee of 7%, or you can tell it pick a fee between 2% and 19% and let it fall where it falls based on how the dice roll. And then that, that works you back up to a price. So um, in many ways, we built the fake data almost in the reverse direction of how um, some traditional estimating techniques get used with uh, support factors, um, ratios, all, all sorts of things there. So it, it is an interesting lens to look at the fake data with. So here's some examples, because uh, like I said, we did build this in a way that a lot of estimating can function. So there's three ways to foundationally add costs into the model. Again, these are all robust from the, uh, from the template, from the configuration file. So one, I can just specify an amount drawn from a probability distribution. I can say $2 million roughly for a base cost for the surface vehicle, normal 2 million with a standard deviation of 100,000. There we go, throw that into the model. I can also pick any support element and say $100,000, that's what I want it to be. Uh, throw in a uniform distribution. If you notice, that's not a typo. It's from A equals 100,000 to B equals 100,000. Guess what, that's a static number. It's always gonna draw 100,000, there's no noise. I just hand jammed a value into it. Uh, you can also allocate things down a work breakdown structure. So now I said, okay, give me two million for the surface vehicle and flow that down to hardware systems. And I did, I used a whole bunch of data from surface vehicles, kind of fuzzed it up a bit and determined how something like this should allocate down to the hardware system. And we did that using a, 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 a distribution I can never pronounce, a, a, a Dirichlet. And uh, I'll talk about it a little on the, actually I don't, I removed that slide and put the bullet on the bottom, sorry. What makes this distribution conveniently is it's multivariate and every draw sums to one. In various presentations over the years, I've seen kind of hacky ways to get to allocations where you, you just simulate things and you divide by the sum and then you come back to it. The Dirichlet is essentially a multivariate data. So that's some of the secret sauce in here, but allows every single draw sample to match the actual allocation. Uh, it gets used 
in a lot of applications, but there's where we're doing it here. So generally anything where you have a higher level and you want to allocate it down to children, you can draw off this distribution. And uh, there's a picture of it on the right, 20, 40, 30% split um, with some noise to it. So that's very convenient. And then a factor of a base. So uh, support factors, for example, project management cost is 10% of the recurring 111 uh, vehicle cost. I'm going to draw that uniform between 8 and 12%, and there will be a factor. So again, any other support factors typically can get used for something like this. Uh, but at the end of the day, you play around with the inputs and see what looks realistic. But this does give you a framework to do it. And um, that, that's kind of why we took this approach. So here's an example of an input sheet. I can show, um, I can show some more of these in a second. Uh, they're a little tedious, but, but an example one is learning. So in here is a screenshot from my Excel file. End item, slope, rate, I actually don't have rate effect working at the moment, but it was put in as a placeholder. It can be added in, turned on as a feature later. Uh, and steady, we're using like a T1000 for this. That's what that represents. So the idea is you're specifying that $2 million or what, or what be it as a steady state cost. And then as Cerberus goes and calculates your quantities, it'll run it back up the learning curve based on how you specify. And the CV is noise. Instead of getting a perfect R squared of 100%, every point, once it draws off its learning slope, will get, in this case, a 2.5% random noise draw. So that, that loads into R. And what's nice about this is it shows an example on just how easily you can change this. If we want a 90% slope instead of 97%, I just simply change those cells in Excel. And then I have a function, load config data, loads right back in the workbook and you're good to go. Cerberus will generate new, new data, or you could just mess with it in R right off the bat. So there's two lines of code there. I know not all of you are R users, but uh, just kind of bear with me. It, it reads pretty well. I just copy the Cerberus specification, and then I just replace the first three slopes with 90%. But you see how you could use code to, to loop over um, 20 different different uh, learning slopes and show data over a whole bunch of learning slopes. So if you wanted to investigate um, different regression, methodolog re regression methodologies for your upcoming ICEA paper in the machine learning track, you could simulate a whole bunch of Cerberus data with a whole bunch of different learning characteristics and use that to back test a new method, which can generally be best practice um, for showing off new methods. So easily adjusted for new input. And um, with that, why don't we jump into some of the uh, some of the goodies here? So if you all can continue to see my screen, Dan, give me a good nod because I can see you. If you've seen the Excel file, there we go. Thank you. So everything's documented up. Uh, fairly well, right? There's, a, there's always more documentation that can be done, but we control versions very heavily within Cerberus. We want everyone to know that when they view reports with the same version number, they line up, they match. So I'm gonna skip away off the documentation page and go to just one of these files. Here's an example of submission. Every row in here becomes a new flex file and quantity report. So right now it does a seven report at, uh, certain dates and time, certain reporting periods. If I wanted to add in a new flex file, I could simply add in a row, and now I have eight flex files. Adam so it's very easy to uh, split out new files into this. Everything from the metadata can be controlled in here, the submission event name, the submission number. In this case, we have submissions two and three are the same date, the revisions of each other. Uh, why? Because submission two, we go slam in a whole bunch of errors into it. Uh, I'll, I'll move quickly here, but you can kind of get the flavor of it. Order of lots, this thing will have three order of lots. I can change phases, I can change ID types. Um, summary remarks, here's all the remarks that get inputted to the data model. The work breakdown structure. Fees. For each order a lot, I can go and you can see what the fees are for each end item. 
So they lose money on the common end item and the second one on average because all the software is in there. How much money? I don't know. It depends how it draws. But if you wanted it to be always 5%, there we go. So the idea is if you replace this with a ship, you could generate a ship using Cerberus. But I'll just pick another random uh, tab here towards the end, one that looks a little scary but not too scary, um, labor mixes. So within different groups, so for the integration cost, the breakout between the engineering labor categories of senior, mid, and junior will be 30%, 30%, 40%, but with random noise. This will all be drawn off the of Dirichlet. So how much noise is in there is controlled by this value here. We built some tools into Cerberus to help you specify these distributions because not everybody has uh, these distributions memorized. Uh, that, that's a uh, academic hazing thing to make PhD students do. But uh, there, there's the gist of it. If there's any questions, we can get to them at the end. I do wanna hit some of the uh, some of the code itself, even though I don't want to live in there, um, it, it's pretty simple. Dan, anything you wanted to hit? No. Keep on moving. So moving on to the R code, uh, I will step through things a little bit. Call library Cerberus, so they say it's not loading a bunch of scripts, it's a package, much like you would download and install a package from uh, anyone else, our users are familiar with packages, but it's compiled. What's nice about that is there's help files. The first function I'm gonna run is randomized config data. If you wanna know what that does, question mark randomized config data, and it gives you a help file, tells you how to use it, it's very useful. So right off the bat, it'll take the Cerberus object, which this is literally just read in the Excel sheet, um, a broken Cerberus, and a seed, one, two, three, four, and it's gonna randomize some input. So uh, I'm gonna blame the slow runtime on the fact that I'm screen sharing. Uh, I can blame Zoom and not me. So here's an example of end items. They're supposed to be around two million, but the random noise, you can see pick some random numbers. And if I wanna change the seed, four, three, two, one, randomize it again, you'll see now that there's different values for those different end items, just simply based on running a different seed. So it's all stochastic. Then you can just simulate the flex file. I ran this test with the screen share before. I think it'll take about 20 seconds, 20, 30 seconds, so bear with me. But what it's doing now is it's going through and taking all that configuration data, and it's probably drawing to the tune of several million random number samples, uh, it's running through several hundred lines of code and it's applying all of these rules. 18 seconds, not bad. Break them out and, and um, what you get there is just a big flat table. It looks like a flex file, but it isn't a flex file. So what we do now is we start breaking it out. We break them into submissions, which is quick. Now you just have a list of a whole bunch of those tables and then you map that back into the data model. This one takes some time as well because what it's doing is checking all the data types, making sure everything passes the rules. Uh, it, it's creating a whole bunch of tables at this point. Let's see if I can talk more while it's still running. Fun facts about it. Uh, no, I'm out of things to say. Running, running, there it is, it's done. So for those of you familiar with the flex file, this will look familiar now. Here's my data model. Here's my seven submissions. Let's just pick one. Um, EMD complete, if I open it, it has two objects in there, a flex file and a quantity report, of type flex file and quantity report using the uh, read flex file package that we have up on, uh, up on the GitHub universe. And there we go, in there are all the tables of the data model. If you open and crack into a flex file uh, official submission, this is what you would get. And here's all the tables. These would be the same same thing that uh, any other tool would see. So here's a flex file, it's just an R, not written down to JSON yet. So there we go. We have our flex file. I have another function there called write to JSON. It's boring, all it does is write to JSON, so we won't show it. 
But to get a little flavor on some of the characteristics of these, much like uh, Dan stepped through, we're going to go ahead and run our other library, uh, which is review CSDR. So we can go ahead and pull out the contract completion flex files and start using some of these functions that we have. So plot units over time, it's flattening the data, it's integrating it all together. You can speed it up, but um, we wanted to make sure it worked on as many networks as possible. So it kind of works as it works. And there we go. There's the learning, the learning type chart that it produced. And this is all off the random data. This is using the sequencing from the quantity report. And this can run for any flex file, not just Cerberus. You might need to uh, help it out and tell it which uh, WBS elements to use. So for example, we can look at the help file, question mark, plot units over time. It tells you what to do. Uh, phases, if you only want to show certain phases remove in process um, quantities, things are still working. So uh, there we go. And now let's go ahead and start playing with some of the things we mentioned. So we'll copy Cerberus, we'll change all the items to a uh, higher CV and a lower learning slope. So 85% learning now with a 10% error. We'll take a look at that table. 85%, same as if we just edited it, would it, edited it within the uh, Excel document. And there we go. I'm going to run it again. I'm going to take out the error report. Server is two, seed one, two, three, four, randomized. Now we have new random values all based on the new seeds. We can rerun and re-simulate Cerberus with the new value. I'll go ahead and run through all of this again. It should be faster because I took out um, kind of the broken report in the middle. I just didn't need to run it for this time. I figured I'd, I'd save us all 15 seconds. So submissions created, data model being created, and then we're going to pull out the final flex file, the final quality report, and then plot the units over time again. Use this as a uh, water break. And there we go. Here's my new plot. And to show it against the other one, on the left is the original one. On the right is now with the much steeper, steeper learning coat, uh, slope and with more error. So you see a lot more spread around the point. If you notice, the pattern is still the same. See these one, two, three, four, five, then three above, one, two, three, four, five, three above. It's because I used the same seed. So the behavior is still consistent to the last one because I drew the same random number, but I multiplied them off of higher bases. So we get a steeper slope. Because we have a steeper slope, when we backed up from the T1000, we now end up with a 10 million, 20 million T1 rather than a seven, 7 million or so. So you see how that you can really just start messing around with parameters within the model quickly and on the fly. Uh, like I said, there's helpers here to help you specify distribution. So there's the uh, Dirichlet with a 20%, uh, 30%, 40% breakout, tons of error. Usually you want some high alpha value. So we'll run that again. Much narrower distributions. We can run that again. And you might look at this and say, okay, that's how I want the... Um, split between three WBS elements to behave. It's going to be between 20 and 25% for one, between 30 and 36 for another, roughly around 45% for the other, and then every draw you do will add to 100. So you have those, those principles. We do phasing. So if you notice, we time phased everything. We don't hand jam those in. Those are based on distribution. So you might need help specifying those. There's a beta with those parameters. There's a beta with other parameters. There's a gamma with some other parameters. There's a truncated normal. So it kind of is, uh, it takes a bit to get a hang of it, but it, it's to help you out with the random number generation. And then you can view properties of your simulation. So here is a, uh, here's the production schedule. So those are the dollars for um, 
recurring, the production dollars. And then on the bottom, here are the quantities in terms of when they finished off. So you see some slow EMD quantities, and then you get into uh, production over here. You see the kits being cranked out. And these will all match to like a total capacity you have. So it'll start to shift phasing with things as you uh, mess around with the numbers. And then to help with all the other reports, just to tie back into other things, there's little helpers in here. Uh, let's see, view this. Here is data that supports the 1921-3, the business space report. So year, all the categories, all the labor categories, dollar hours, the rate that gets calculated, uh, whether it's direct or labor. So you can easily pull things out from Cerberus to build up other data deliverables or look at data however you want. It, it's really once you have the data here, you can do a whole ton with it. So uh, with that, that, that's how Cerberus works and how it generates data. As Dan mentioned, part of this whole thing is, is the way to look at the data and to help evaluate it as well. So we use review CSDR. I, did I get rid of my library statement? I did. Library review CSDR, just like any other R package, once installed, validate the results pulls together this uh, table here. And we won't look at that because what I'm going to do instead is write that to Excel. It's that easy. You just use the function validate flex file. I'm actually validating all seven of them iteratively in the data model. So if you had a folder of flex files, you could just hit the do my job for me button. Uh, not really. It really just gives you some looks. You still need to put your eyes on it and figure out what it says and what it means. But for now, we're building this uh, evaluation. It's checking every row and every table of the data model and then validating it back against a set of like 420 rules. So um, this is a little more advanced, but I'm writing all of these now down to Excel. So I hit run on that line, and you can see in my folder a bunch of Excel documents start appearing. And just to pop open one, we'll actually take this 2016 one, which has errors in it. And here we go. On the cover page, it tells you what file was ran. Nothing, because I just did it from memory right now, but it'll tell you the file name if you read in a flex file. Um, versions, and then here's all the errors. So tags are blank. Order a lot IDs are missing. Uh, why is your fee zero? Why are your metadata things happening? Why is the contract price greater than the price at complete uh, with actuals greater than forecast? And you can poke through this, but it'll step you through every table and show you the lines there's an error. So in this line here, it's telling me it has error 4-2, which is contract price is greater than the reporting uh, price at complete. Uh, so we'd have to go and check that. Actual cost hour data, it's not happy because there is none. Um, so there we go, things were broken. Allocation components. Just, it, it'll just step you through everything. So one view I like is this uh, 1921 view, where it'll go through and show you rows where the actual dollars are greater than the forecast dollars. So it can help you target things and find find potential errors as you're looking through a flex file, or just help you uh, help you peruse it on your own. So we're coming near on time here, so I'll click out of that. And then one thing you can also do is have it similarly loop through a whole bunch of uh, PowerPoint files that'll output. So I hit run, and they'll start showing up again in my folder creating a whole bunch of graphics, writing the PowerPoint, and I have my OneDrive sync on, so that's uh, probably not helping. But I'm gonna wait to get a, a few more here before pulling up to show what these PowerPoints look like. It's just kind of a quick means to get a, some visual, visual looks on it. So let's get past EMD. Annual, yeah, annual submission 2018 review. Let's open this. Gives you a cover page, tells you all the waivers. 
uh, gives you some information about your R session, what was used. So when it, uh, if you're having uh, discrepancies with someone else, you can see if there's something with your session. Gives you some info on the file that we read in, just so you can identify, you know what you're talking about. And then some of these graphs that Dan showed before, these are drawn on the fly. So they're not just server specific. These will run for any flex file. Uh, you might need to tweak some inputs to tell it what work breakdown structures are what. But here it is, broke out the recurring, non-recurring over time. Dan talked to these before, but now we're seeing these at this time snapshot, right? Not the completed contract, support element. Not all the quantities are done yet. So here's the learning and the sequence learning curve off the quantity report based on this time snapshot, the cost, uh, labor rates over time, and average like overhead rates and how those are moving. So these are easy, these are easy to add to. This is meant to be a whole framework structure, not the end solution. So if people wanna add things to it, absolutely that can be done. But that pretty much takes me through Cerberus and some of the uh, highlights of review CSDR. Dan, anything you wanna to add to that? Well, I think that was a great overview, Adam. I'm, I'm sure everybody is, uh is really eager to get into some of those packages and start building their own things. And I, I really do thank you for that overview. All right, uh, back to you then for uh, how to access. Awesome, thanks again, Adam. Um, so at this point, hopefully you're, you're ready. You're eager to go get the example data for Cerberus or you've seen Adam go over the, uh, the Cerberus package and you wanna start simulating your own data for your own purposes. Um, so this, this next couple of slides tells you how to go get that Cerberus data proper. Um, and today we are gonna have the uh, Cerberus package and those supporting elements uploaded into DTM Hub, which is currently only available to government folks, but we are working to get a copy of Cerberus, the package and some of those other supporting files made more publicly available. Uh, but just note that we're only gonna talk you through what is publicly available right now on these slides. Um, to get these, they live in Facade, which is, I, I don't know if this is its formal name or what, but I've always thought it was called, meant to be called Facade. And so Cade is the database where we keep all these CSDR data and where uh, uh, contractors submit the data, where government analysts go get the data. And so we're using the framework we already have in place. Again, this is a way to help teach people how to understand and use Cade or Facade. Um, and so you'll, if you don't have login credentials, you can get them and you can request access to get uh, access, again, you don't need to have a CAT card here. You don't need to be a government person. Anybody can get access to Cade, a fake Cade, excuse me. Um, once you're in there, there's gonna be two major lines of attack to get these files. Uh, the first is the submit and review system. That's kind of shown on the screen here. That's gonna get you like all the planning documents, the CSDR plan, the scope of work, Cedral documents, all the things that sort of would go into that initial contract planning process. Adam, next slide. If you wanted to get the data deliverables, the flex files, the QDR, the MNR, the SRDRs, then you would go through the uh, data and analytics module of, of Facade. Again, real world here, if you are an analyst and you need to learn how to use Cade, this is your opportunity. Um, you can go to the CSDR browse, search for the Cerberus program, and then you're presented with all the different uh, submissions for Cerberus. Uh, Cade and Facade have a bunch of several different ways to get data out, depending on if you want the raw JSON, if you want it ported to Excel, if you want a bulk data export, lots of things available to you. And you can use that uh, UI that we've already got built in uh, to get that data out. Um, Adam, next slide. Uh, last but not least, uh, the SAR data, I've mentioned this before, the data, the file actually exists. We're just doing some backend work to make sure that the, um, the SAR database viewer uh, appears correctly. You could go in there today and you could search, you wouldn't find it, but in the not too distant future, that server's data will be there. Um, keep an eye out on the home, uh, the Cade homepage uh, or the news page. We'll try to post when different files become available. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome, so, so that's probably once through the universe. We've talked and covered a lot of ground today. We talked about the Cerberus program. We talked about why we built this, this stuff. We looked at the Cer uh, some examples of the Cerberus training data set. And then Adam really teased the power that is the Cerberus package. 
you know, you could come, you could be leaving today and just go get the Cerberus training data set and you'd be better off. You'd have some real good world data to start working from. But like Adam teased, if you, if you dig into the Cerberus package, you could create hundreds of Cerberuses or hundreds of different types of data and then start to look at, you know, really big amounts of data over time uh, with varying inputs and outputs. And you could build some really cool tools that look at hundreds of CSDR simultaneously or again, you could just look at a single CSDR submission at any given point in time. Both of those are good things. I hope both, I hope people start to leverage both of those capabilities. Um, today, you know, version 1.0, we still need to get that SAR data uploaded uh, to really round out version 1.0. Uh, 1.1 is already in process. We're adding some allocation examples into the Flex file, which is a big thing for some contractors. Um, and then again, we're maturing the data deliverable format for the resource distribution table. As soon as that format is, is, is locked in, we're gonna um, update and produce some examples to load up into the system as well there. On the, on the backlog, um, you know, we've got a couple of different things that we wanna potentially get after, like baking in the Excel files directly, potentially baking in a one and done zip file that just gives you all of this in one straight shot. Again, it's a little bit of a feature to teach people how to use Facade. One big zip file would maybe not let people learn how to use Facade, which frankly, we it's always good to use an opportunity to get that across. Um, and then, you know, we want to round out some things like adding more detail to the CSTR WBS dictionary. You know, again, if you're doing big data type stuff, you're not going to be super interested in that. Um, you know, dictionaries are dictionaries. They're helpful for real, real, real data. But for this fake data, it's sort of just as icing on the cake. Um, if when you're downloading files, you're using files, you're using the packages, you can't find them. Um, we've got the uh, CADE or uh, um, help desk number there or email address rather. Uh, that's your best place to go put feature requests or bugs. Um, and then we'll rack and stack them along with everything else that we've got going on. Um, so at this point, you know, I really hope people take away something from this or hopefully a couple different somethings. Please do leverage this tool, you know, use it to develop your own training. Uh, use it to figure out how to use flex files or how to use SRDRs or, or, SRDRs or, or any of the like. Um, demo your own models and techniques using this. Again, if everybody uses Cerberus, it's one fewer thing that we kind of have to intellectually understand when we're looking at these different tools. Um, and, you know, build your own things from it as well. Practice, practice in Power BI, practice in Python, practice in Excel. You know, there's a lot of great data here that you can start building and, and looking at interesting things. Um, next slide, please. Last and last, but certainly not least, I want to acknowledge that there, this was really a team effort to build this thing. Um, you know, the, it was funded by the CADE contract, um, but that included folks from uh, the Technomics and Techalodi contractor support offices. They're listed there. You know, I provided some input, but we had some, I really had some help from some government SMEs who know the SRDR better than I do. Um, it's always important to give acknowledgement to the team. They're the ones that really did the work, um, not me to some extent. You know, I've used some briefings in this package. We want to give credit there. Non-standard R packages that were used are there. And then those data sets always give credit where credit's due when briefing. And so that's what this is. Uh, I thank the team for all their work on this. I hope you find it helpful. Uh, look forward to getting any questions, comments, or concerns from you all. And I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, with that, back to you, George. Thanks, Dan. Uh, please, uh, Please use the URL here to provide feedback for ICEA uh, for today's luncheon. Um, our uh, results here will help us decide what types of uh, events and topics we'll have for the future. And uh, you will help us uh, determine this year's luncheon presentation excellence award. Um, and just to note, we, we are uh, in a few weeks, we'll have another luncheon that will be a, a hybrid in person and virtual. Um, we're trying to uh, uh, to, to bring back the, some of the in-person events here in the future and looking forward to that too. So look, look, uh, look out for another announcement uh, for the next luncheon as well. Thanks for your participation. Right. Um, and I'll hand it over here to, uh, to Bob. Uh, thanks, George. So just want to quickly talk about everybody here about the benefits of joining ICEA. Um, if you're on this call, maybe you got sent a link um, by somebody in your organization, um, please consider joining ICEA. It's a great organization. I've been a member for well over a decade now. Um, just some of the benefits are you get discounts on things like conference attendance, which is coming up in I think a little over a month. Um, it's a great conference venture at many times. Um, you get discounts on ICEA certification exams. 
um, which I would recommend if you're a, building a lot of cost estimates, um, having a certification does build your own credibility, as well as CBOC, which is some of the, um, the training material that's been developed over the past many years. Um, so you, you get discounts, you get um, access to local and regional seminars, you get links such as um, we, at the, at the Washington ICA chapter, we try to hold at least monthly uh, presentations like this, so we'll invite you. Um, you get the ICA World Magazine, you get, you can submit papers to that, um, and, and as well as access to the ICA Career Center. Um, and, and also, I will say, if you are an ICA member, and you live in the Washington area, please log into the website and um, choose, you can choose your chapter, choose the Washington ICA chapter. Um, it does help us, help, help a local chapter get the funding we need, as well as then you, you become a part of the email list for any local events. Uh, we have a lot of stuff we're working on this year and we, we hope to see you there. But again, if you're not an ICA member, please look to, to, to join. Um, if you do work at, um, next slide, Adam. If you work at a company, uh, a private company, many will reimburse for that. Um, it's about 95 bucks a year for one year membership. There are savings if you do it for multiple years or if you're a student, but um, I really would encourage you to please consider that and um, get, get involved. You know, we, we'd love help from anybody um, and everybody in this community. Back to you, George. Yep, thank, thank you. And, and just note the, the, the survey is in the chat too. You can click on the link there for the survey. Thank you. And we look forward to the next uh, the next event we have. Look for another announcement coming out uh, for our, our, our next luncheon, which will be both uh, virtual and in person. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.